This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. Behind Secretary of State Kissinger's latest offers to negotiate for the so-called normalization of relations with Hanoi, and Hanoi's playing hard to get, lies an unfinished chapter of the Vietnam tragedy. It involves the more than 1,300 American servicemen still listed as MIA, missing in action, one year after the end of the Vietnam War and more than three years after the conclusion of the Paris Peace Agreement. The National League of Families, composed of more than 3,000 relatives of the MIAs and POWs, has refused to give up its three-year effort to determine the fate of their loved ones, despite lack of official cooperation in both Washington and Hanoi. The League's executive director, Colonel Earl P. Hopper, Sr., whose own son, Air Force Captain Earl Hopper, Jr., was lost on a mission over North Vietnam in January 1968 says the main issue is Hanoi's insistence on three and a quarter billion dollars in U.S. aid. When the Paris uh, agreements were signed and Vietnam won the war and kicked the Americans out of Southeast Asia, the Vietnamese considered this a, a major victory and as a result published and reprinted the Paris Agreement and distributed it throughout the land so that the uh, Vietnamese people could read it and then could see that they were in fact the victors over the imperialist Americans. Because of this, the Vietnamese people are holding the North Vietnamese government to a fulfillment of Article 21. And consistently, each time then, that we bring up to them a compliance with Article 8B in accounting of the MIAs and return of the remains of the dead, they in turn throw back into our face the provisions and the promise of, by the Nixinger administration of fulfillment of Article 21, wherein the Nixon administration promised the North Vietnamese in a letter to give them $3.25 billion without conditions for the reconstruction of Vietnam. Colonel Hopper says the issue of the MIAs is caught in a battle of semantics. Nixon and Kissinger have both denied that this letter has any basis for it because there were caveats attached to it. But the North Vietnamese government maintain it is still a legal commitment by the United States and caught between the Kissinger denial and the insistence by their people that that provision be fulfilled, we, the families of the, of the uh, prisoners and missing in action, are also caught in a bind. We're caught in the middle between the devious and deceitful statements by our own State Department that originally there was no provision for any financial aid to North Vietnam, and now a refusal by the Vietnamese to cooperate in giving us an accounting as long as this stand is taken by the United States government. Colonel Earl P. Hopper, Sr. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. This has been the American Security Council's Washington Report of the Year. For a transcript of today's program or a free copy of the current Washington Report newsletter, write to the American Security Council Press, Culpeper, Virginia. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. Exasperated by what many members feel is the growing irresponsibility of the United Nations, the Senate has voted for a year-long study of U.S. participation in the U.N., including the question of whether the U.S. should withdraw from the world body altogether. Senator Dewey F. Bartlett, the Oklahoma Republican, has urged that at the very least, the U.S. should sharply reduce its annual contribution, now accounting for one-fourth of the entire U.N. budget. The new majority in the UN, by circumventing the Security Council, has shifted some political power to the General Assembly. Through procedural credentials challenges they have, in Orwellian style, made the 15 million citizens of Taiwan non-people, even though Taiwan is larger in population and more legitimate in the sense of governmental legitimacy than are many other members of the UN. Disenfranchising South Africa sets the stage for a probable similar attempt against Israel. The first move in this direction was the General Assembly resolution equating Zionism and racism, a preposterous proposition. <laughs>
Senator Bartlett says the U.S., if it remains in the U.N., must realize that it is playing under a new set of rules. A working 73-vote majority in the General Assembly can be fashioned from countries whose combined population is about 176 million people, or only 5% of the world's population. We must then ask ourselves, what action can we take to help prevent the, to prevent the G- degeneration of the UN to a barbarous parliament, as described by British writer Paul Johnson in a recent essay in the New Republic. I favor constructive, assertive participation, but the United States should no longer blindly accept the argument that our country must assume a special responsibility to finance the United Nations because we are the wealthiest country in the world. I believe my legislation, which reduces our contribution to the UN by 2% per year for five years, provides an orderly, realistic shift of monetary responsibility to other nations. I believe further that this shift of monetary responsibility is necessary to foster a more mature political atmosphere. The success or failure of the United Nations rests with all member nations. The third world countries are using the United Nations as a forum and the United States as a whipping boy to demand a new world economic order. If the monetary stake of the third world countries is increased, The goal of my legislation is that they will be more prudent and responsible in pursuing their own interests. Senator Dewey Bartlett of Oklahoma. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. This has been the American Security Council's Washington Report of the Year. For a transcript of today's program or a free copy of the current Washington Report newsletter, write to the American Security Council Press, Culpeper, Virginia. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. The power struggle in communist China between Mao Zedong's hardline revolutionaries and so-called moderates led by followers of the late Zhou Enlai is far from over and may become even more violent in months to come. Such is the view of P.P. Tong, managing editor of the international edition of the Central Daily News of Taiwan, who keeps a close watch on developments in mainland China. Tong, member of a group of visiting news media leaders from Taiwan, says the deposing of Zhou's man, first vice premier Deng Xiaoping, is part of a continuing struggle that has gone on for years. Right now, the power struggle between uh, the so-called the uh, uh, Cultural Revolutionary Group, headed by Mao Zedong's wife Jiang Qing, and the uh, moderates, as uh, organized by uh, uh, Zhou Enlai, is uh, much more serious than uh, the outsiders could imagine because it is a uh, power struggle for the uh, top uh, authority that means uh, the the, uh, the 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 power to rule the land after Mao Zedong is dead because Mao is uh, himself uh, now uh, 82 years old and he's not going to be uh, there for long so Jiang Qing has started uh, the recent uh, power struggle with the, with the help of her husband to groom him herself for the top job. And that's why Hua Guofeng was uh, picked up as uh, the acting premier uh, instead of Deng Xiaoping, who has been regarded uh, in the West as the logical successor to Zhou after uh, Zhou's death in last January. Tong says what has happened thus far, the rioting in Peking's main square and the threats of retaliation by the ruling Maoists, is only a sample of what is in store. It's going to be a uh, very very violent struggle uh, when uh, Mao dies. And this struggle will continue, of course, after Mao dies. It is not uh, wise to say that uh, Deng Xiaoping is uh, completely... uh, 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 out of power now. The, the recent struggle uh, initiated by Jiang Qin's group uh, that uh, they are using the urban militia people and uh, it was designed to uh, to counter the uh, People's Liberation Army. The, uh, the struggle right now is uh, 
much more complicated than the outsiders would ever know. Managing Editor Tong of the International Edition of the Central Daily News of Taiwan. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. This has been the American Security Council's Washington Report of the Year. For a transcript of today's program or a free copy of the current Washington Report newsletter, write to the American Security Council Press, Culpeper, Virginia. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. Ever since the 1973 Middle East War and the crippling oil boycott, many Americans have thought of the Arab world as a lost cause. Not necessarily so, says retired U.S. Ambassador Parker T. Hart, who served 25 years in the Middle East. In fact, says Hart, Egypt's turn from the Soviet Union to the U.S. is indicative of a hopeful new trend in the Arab world. I feel that the American role in the Middle East over the past few years has taken a new realistic turn and that the position of the United States in the area as a whole has rather improved, contrary to many popular assumptions. I feel that uh, uh, this is largely due to the fact that there is a groundswell in the area for development, for modernization, which is deeper and more fundamental than most other motivations in the area, and that the shortcomings of Soviet technology have been felt, and while I think the relationship of a number of the countries to the Soviet Union in the aid field and trade field will continue, that they've also found the need to go for Western technology. And this has meant uh, very heavy emphasis on American technology as well as on Western European and Japanese. Ambassador Hart says Egyptian President Sadat's westward turn served to accelerate a development underway in other Arab lands. In Iraq today, Western businessmen American businessmen included are most warmly welcomed because they can bring a technological aspect to uh, uh, industrialization efforts of the country which has been needed very badly. Uh, one of the difficulties has been that the Soviet relationship has meant uh, that many of the industrial facilities brought in under trade agreements with the Soviet Union have not been quite modern enough. Uh, the supp supplies and spare parts and the servicing uh, the maintenance of these facilities have been difficult and often lacking, I think reflecting a condition within the Soviet Union itself. And consequently, they do need uh, the Western help. Uh, that doesn't mean they're cutting their ties with the Soviet Union, but it means a new emphasis. And I think it's quite, quite pronounced and quite perceptible in Syria, and certainly in Egypt. Uh, it's been radical. Hart says the Arab world's emphasis on economic aid and development has acted to discourage any would-be military moves by the major powers. Any force play by the Soviet Union would, would kill their position throughout the area, and automatically, just as one by us would do the same. We've had a lot, a lot of loose talk about our occupying oil, oil fields. Well, if we ever were foolish enough to undertake a measure of that kind, we would burn our bridges with the entire area. Ambassador Parker T. Hart with some advice and some hopeful signs in the always volatile Middle East. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. This has been the American Security Council's Washington Report of the Year. For a transcript of today's program or a free copy of the current Washington Report newsletter, write to the American Security Council Press, Culpeper, Virginia. That's the American Security Council Press, Culpeper, Virginia. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. A British Defense Ministry report on Soviet military production reveals that the Soviet Union is stepping up its arms build up at an ever-increasing rate. The 14-page report prepared for the British Parliament says the Soviets this year will deploy more than 200 new generation intercontinental ballistic missiles. The new Soviet missiles are vastly more powerful than the 1,560 ICBMs already in place, and nearly all of the new Soviet models are equipped with MIRVs, or multiple warheads. Based on NATO and other Western intelligence sources, the British report provides a detailed picture of the growing might of Russia's nuclear and conventional arsenals. During this year, says the report, the Soviet Union will add to its forces 1,000 new combat aircraft, mostly swing-wing, highly sophisticated types, about two dozen more supersonic backfire bombers, adding to the 50 already built, more than 700 helicopters, more than 3,000 additional tanks, 4,000 armored personnel carriers, 
and as many as 10 new nuclear submarines. Six of these new subs will each carry 12 to 18 ballistic missiles of 4,800 mile range. The report also discloses for the first time how Soviet military production is organized. The Soviet Defense Ministry is the sole procurement agency for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. It coordinates military production carried on by no fewer than eight government ministries. The head of the defense industrial sector is Dmitry Ustinov, recently promoted to full membership in the ruling Politburo. Other highlights of the British report, there are now between 30 and 40 aircraft factories in the Soviet Union. Production of liquid propellant long-range ICBMs reached 400 a year by the late 1960s. A new intermediate range missile with a solid propellant also is now being developed. Soviet tank production has averaged 3,000 a year, enabling the Soviet Union to maintain a force of some 40,000 main battle tanks. A new Soviet tank, the T-72, with improved firepower and mobility, has entered production. The report reveals that Soviet ground and sea forces are now receiving equipment of increasing technical sophistication. They no longer need rely solely on sheer numbers for superiority. Soviet tank production has been geared to provide quick response to emergency demands, as in the rapid resupply of Syrian and Egyptian forces after the 1973 Middle East War. In an illustration of the extent of Soviet military buildup, the report notes that the world's largest submarine building yard is now in the Soviet Union, only 350 miles south of the Arctic Circle. Analyzing Soviet production methods, the report says costs have been cut by wide standardization of equipment and components. This, it says, accounts largely for the relative speed with which the Russian shipyards can turn out combat vessels. The same obviously applies to the increasing volume of missiles, tanks, guns, and other weapons of war now rolling from Soviet production lines, detente notwithstanding. This is Philip C. Clark in Washington. This has been the American Security Council's Washington Report of the Year. For a transcript of today's program or a free copy of the current Washington Report newsletter, write to the American Security Council Press, Culpeper, Virginia. 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 
Culpeper, Virginia. Culpeper, Virginia. Culpeper, Virginia. Culpeper, Virginia. Culpeper, Virginia.